Bible from 2 Samuel chapter number 6, focusing on verses 14 through 23. But uh, I will uh, try to lay a little bit of groundwork. Uh, I appreciate all that came to leadership class this morning at, at 8.30 and then at 8.35 and 8.40 and, and uh, all, all points in between. But uh, we did have a good time. We had close to 20, I think it was, in there, and I, I appreciate that. And uh, the, the idea is to get everybody involved. Amen? Amen. I want to be involved. And I'm gonna, we're going to learn another way for everybody to be involved. Everybody say before. Before, that's the title of the message today. In this passage of Scripture, David is basking in the afterglow of a multi-victorious battle with the Philistines. He has defeated them twice as they, in one place they were attacking him, and in another place they just came out against him, and he rose up and went out and defeated them. He is new, relatively new in his anointing. Brother Robbie are actually relatively new in functioning in his anointing as he has been anointed for quite some years. And with these victories, he now has a capital city. And the name of that city is Zion. And it's formerly as Jebusite stronghold, and which is the name, the Zion is the name of one of the hills Jerusalem was situated on. So now that they have a, a capital city and now that they, that they have things have been restored a little bit and the Philistines have been defeated, David goes to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has been gone for quite a number of years. I, I read in one place where it stayed where it's at about 50 years. The Ark of the Covenant has been gone. Now the Ark of the Covenant was a little wooden chest that was overlaid with gold. On top of it was the mercy seat. Everybody say the mercy seat. Aren't you grateful for the mercy of God? And it was covered by two winged cherubims. That Their wings went toward each other on top of it. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant were the original stone tablets upon which were written the Ten Commandments. There was a pot of manna and also Aaron's rod that budded, the, the staff that Aaron carried that budded with flowers out on it as a demonstration of the supernatural power of God. The mercy seat is where the Shekinah or the glory of God would come down and dwell on in between those cherubims on the day of atonement and the high priest would visit and commune with the power of God, with the Spirit of God or the glory of God on the mercy seat on the day of atonement. The ark was of great significance both physically and spiritually to the children of Israel and to their enemies. I remember one particular time that the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp of the Israelites, Brother Pete, and they began to rejoice and they began to be excited. And the Philistines heard that and they automatically said, well, the Ark must be back. We shouldn't even fight them because they're going to beat us every time that the Ark of the Covenant is in their presence. When the Ark of the Covenant was present, morale was up. Optimism was high and one didn't have to guess whether the ark of the Lord was in their midst or not. Nobody had to guess if the presence of the Lord was manifested among them or not because not only was it physically there, Brother Pete, but they also acted like it. Hello? I said they acted like the presence of the Lord was among them. Saints of God, i got to let you know, when we come together like this, uh, you can rest assured the presence of the Lord is here and we need to act like it. There's something real. There's something powerful. There's something beautiful. There's nothing like it in the whole world, the presence of the Lord. But the ark was taken in battle. The sons of Eli, they were also priests, Hophni and Phinehas. The sons of Eli were living a sinful, terrible, ugly lifestyle. They were using their office in the priesthood to, to have sexual relations with ladies in the actual tabernacle and on the porch of the tabernacle. And they took more than was allotted to the ministry. They were greedy, they were gluttonous, they were sinful. And they were the leaders of the armies of Israel and they went out trying to, trying to use the presence of the Lord as a crutch to allow for their sinful lifestyle. But because of that, the Bible said they were defeated and the Ark of the Covenant was taken prisoner by the Philistines. Now, we well know that the Philistines couldn't keep it very long. They set the Ark of the Covenant in the, in the place where their God, their God was and in the morning they woke up, his head had fell off. 
So they propped his head back up, left him one more day, Brother Billy. And when they came in the next day, the whole image had fell down. His head fell off, his arms had fell off, and he was broke all to pieces. Right quick, fast, Sister Sharon, they decided we don't want to mess around the presence of the Lord. We can whoop up on some sinful Israelites. We can defeat people that ain't living right. But we can't mess with the presence of the Lord. Oh, we've got to come to great grips with the, with the magnitude of what it means to have the presence of God among us. We've got to come to grips with the fact that, that we can't afford to gather not one time. I don't care if it's at somebody's house. I don't care where you might be, whether it's a, 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 a concert or whether it's a rally or just regular church. We cannot gather together without inviting, welcoming, and entertaining the presence of the Lord when He comes in here. Hallelujah. The ark was gone. It's just a little side note. The wife of Phineas, I believe it was, was expecting a baby. And when news came that the ark of the covenant had been taken, she was in the middle of childbirth. And Brother Billy, she died giving birth to that child. But before she died, she gave him a name. And that name was Ichabod which means the glory of the Lord has departed. That it even sounds, I know the only Ichabod that we're familiar with is the Sleepy Hollow Ichabod, but that, that name even sounds, Brother Pete, just... And then, Brother Rice, when we realize what it represents, that the wife of the one that was leading in the rebellion recognized that the glory of the Lord has departed. Can I tell you something? Don't matter where you live, don't matter how you dress, don't matter how you look, don't matter how you talk, if you don't have the glory of the Lord, you ain't no different than nobody else. You look the part, you act the part, you give an offering, you show up for church, but if you don't have the glory of the Lord, in you, you're no different than nobody else. Look, Brother Rice, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short, of the glory of God. Without His help, I can't be there. Without the Spirit of the Lord, I can't be there. Without the presence of God, I can't make it. He had to bridge the gap from my inadequacies to fulfillment. And it's only done through the power of His Spirit. So for 50 years, the Ark of the Covenant, because the Philistines said, get it out of here. We don't want it. We thought we did, but we found out we don't. Get it out of here. So it was taken to the northern part of Judah to Abinadab's house. Abinadab's house. And for some 50 years it has been there in Bala, a city in the northern part of Judah. But David decides to go back and get the Ark of the Covenant. And he takes 30,000 men with him. So they get the Ark of the Covenant and they start on their way back. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 6 and 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. But in the midst of the festivities, in the middle of the rejoicing, in the middle of the worship, the Ark of the Covenant's riding on a cart. And I don't have time to get into it, Brother McKinney, but that's not the way the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be transported. It was riding on a cart, Brother Billy. And the cart undoubtedly hit a truck hole, pothole, rut the road, something. Brother Jackie, the Ark of the Covenant became jostled around. It started to tip over. And Uzzah reached out his hand and put it on the Ark of the Covenant to steady it. And the Bible says he was struck dead immediately. Because the Lord had directed him that nobody's to touch the Ark of the Covenant. David, he doesn't understand this. And in fact, it displeases him and to some degree makes him afraid. Have anybody ever been afraid when he didn't understand what God was doing? Anybody ever been displeased with God? Oh, don't be scared. So he decides not to continue the journey and leaves the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Obed-Edom. So it stays there for a little while, Sister Marie, and then word comes to David. Obed-Edom, his house, and all that pertaineth to him. That means his critters, that means his job, 
That, oh, God have mercy. That means his crops. That means everything that Obed-Edom has to do with is being blessed. <laughs> Ooh, I just felt a little bit of that, I believe. David found out that Obed-Edom was being blessed because of the presence of the Lord being there. Let me just give you a little key for victory. You know the presence of the Lord is going to be here because somebody's been praying. Whether it's you or not, the presence of the Lord is going to be here. And we're Holy Ghost filled. He said we're two or three together together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. And He's here whether we acknowledge Him or not. He's here. But let me tell you something. You want victory? You truly want to live a victorious life? You get Him in your house. You get the presence of the Lord in your house. And everything you got will be blessed. <laughs> My God. So, David is encouraged now. He's heard this. It appears that he thought that there was some sort of a curse or negative stigma. They were all shook up because Uzzah touched the ark and died. But he's now come to the realization. I want you to hear this. He has now come to the realization, Brother McKinney, that it wasn't a matter of judgment issue. It wasn't a judgment issue that Uzzah had to die, but it was a respect issue that nobody better elevate themselves into a place where they don't have to follow the law of God. No one is to underestimate the value and power of the presence of the Lord. So now he makes plans to finish the journey of bringing the ark of God back into residence among his people. The Bible tells us that the, the, the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And as they journeyed, and by the way, just another little side note, the Ark of the Covenant ain't riding on a cart this time. But the priesthood is carrying it on their shoulders just like they were supposed to in the beginning. Let me tell you something, as, as crazy as it may sound, and it always doesn't make sense. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in Corinthians in more than one place that the wisdom of God is what? Foolishness to men. The Bible tells us that. But if Brother Pete, if God says do it, just go on ahead and do it. Okay, you're going to be blessed. Whether it makes sense or not, just do it God's way. This is His world. We're just living in it. He made us like He wanted us to be. They journeyed, Sister Maria carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And every six paces, they stopped and offered sacrifice unto the Lord. Every six paces they offered a burnt offering or peace offering unto the Lord. And 2 Samuel 6 and 14 says, And David danced. God have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost in here this morning. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. According to the dictionary that I have, Zondervan's Bible Dictionary, the Hebrews, like ancient people, they had their sacred dances. They had their rituals. They would do it in a group. You can still see some of them. It was not unlike what, what we might have seen the American Indian do on the frontier, but it was, it was choreographed dancing in, in their, in their uh, uh, ceremonial procedures. And they were performed on solemn anniversaries and other great occasions of commemorating some special token of divine goodness in favor of God. But when the Bible says that David danced before the Lord with all of his might, that is intim intimating violent efforts. Everybody say violent. Efforts. Brother McKinney, here's a beautiful thing about this. Didn't nobody make David do that. And you don't find anywhere where the Bible tells us for him to do that. Right? It wasn't something that was planned. It wasn't choreographed. But the Bible says he danced before the Lord with all his might, with violent efforts of leaping. And in the middle of his dance, he divested himself of his royal mantle. It was conduct apparently unsuitable to the 
age that he was or the dignity of a king. But it was done as an act of homage unto God. His attitude and dress being symbolic of penitence, joy, thankfulness, and devotion. So verse 15 says, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Verse 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window. Everybody say, look through a window. And saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Now I've got to make a few things clear here. Michael loved David. Saul had in fact promised his older daughter to David. But as he was wont to do to David, he reneged and gave her to somebody else. But he found out that his younger daughter Michael loved David. He encouraged their marriage. Brother Richard, he planned on Michael being his ally in the house of David. But when they came for him, Brother Rice, she hid David, put a straw figure under his covers, Brother Billy, to deceive Saul and his soldiers, and she let David down the wall, Brother McKinney, so he would be safe. She didn't want anything to happen to David because she loved him. She was enamored with him. She was, she was in love with her husband. So now verse 16, the ark of the Lord is returning. The presence of the Lord is returning. The morale will go up. The blessings of the Lord will be evident in their lives. And David is leading. God have mercy. David is leading in the rejoicing and the dancing and celebrating the return of the glory of God to this capital city. And as the ark of the Lord enters the city, and people are dancing and people are playing on their instruments and people are leaping and jumping and shouting, Y'all don't like it sometimes when I say this. But when we leap and jump and shout and run the aisles, we ain't doing it in the Spirit. We're doing it in response to the Spirit. The Holy Ghost ain't never one time made me clap my hands. If you're waiting on the Holy Ghost to get you out in the aisle, you're going to be waiting a while. Huh? It's effort. It's a decision that I make to violently, with maximum effort and great joy and great anticipation, to worship the Lord. And Michael looked out the window. And saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. The first problem that I see here is what's wrong with this picture? The only one we see that has any, anything wrong in their heart. God, help me right now. Help me, Holy Ghost. The only one we see that has issues in their heart and in the way they're viewing things, the whole of Israel is shouting and dancing and playing and rejoicing. Except for the one that's just looking through the window. Except for the one, oh God, help me right now. The, except for the one that's merely an observer. She's looking through the window. She's watching him through the window. In the shelter of her little, her little fortress that she lives in. It's a view from the window experience versus the experience and knowledge and respect for the presence of the Lord being ushered in. The power of the Lord is returning. The glory of the Lord is here. And all of Israel's rejoicing and Michael is peeking through the window. Although Michael, oh God. Although Michael loved David, she cared for him. She didn't want nothing to happen to him. 
She did not comprehend Him. She didn't get Him. She didn't understand what the Lord meant to Him. She saw, oh God, Lord in mercy, help us get the Spirit of David on us. I want to be like David. The Bible says that the Lord searched for him a man after his own heart. He's the one that defined David as a man after his own heart. David didn't put that title on himself, Brother Pete. But she saw the king making a fool of himself. She saw the king leaping and dancing and twirling around and maybe stopping and grab somebody's jug from him and blew on it a little bit or, or grab somebody's tambourine and shook it just a little bit and he's twirling and dancing and shouting and hollering and making a literal fool of himself. Somebody said amen. amen. He was. He was. And she saw the king looking like a dummy. Royalty, dignity, authority, heritage, tradition. She knew how the king was supposed to act. And he, oh Lord. And that wasn't it. Listen to me right now. The only time we ever find David viewing himself as a king, he ruined his life. The only time we find David when he elevated himself and abused his power by sending for another man's wife, he ruined his life. Because Sister Maria, right that minute, David didn't, he wasn't even thinking of himself as king. He wasn't even acknowledging himself as king. He had took off his kingly garments. He took off his crown, so to speak. He had stepped out of his official capacity and he remembered himself. Coming up the lane. Man, there's a bunch of people gathered in the front yard. I wonder what's going on. There, I, I see all my brothers and I see my dad and my mama. I, I think that might look like Samuel the prophet. I wonder what's happening around here. About that time the old prophet said, come here boy. He took out a horn of oil. Yeah. David wasn't dancing before the Lord because he was a king. He was dancing before the Lord because he remembered stinking like sheep. He remembered coming in with the stain of a bloody bear on one leg and the stain of a bloody lion on another leg. And he was nasty and he was just coming to the Father's house. But then the anointing of the Lord came down on him. And if you read how they anointed him back then, it wasn't like we do now with a couple of drops in on their forehead. But they forevermore put the whammy jammy on them. They poured it over top of them. It ran all down their face. It pulled at their feet. And Brother Pete, he wasn't remembering, I finally get to be the king. He was recognizing that every... Everything I got. Everything I am. Or everything I ever hope to be. I owe it to what this represents. Everything I am. Or everything I ever hope to be. I owe it to the Lord. The Lord gave me my wife. The Lord gave me my children. The Lord gave me everything. So if that's all I can do. To let Him know I appreciate it. Is make a fool out of myself. Then take this crown. And take robe, I'm going to let him know that I am appreciative of what he gave me, of where he brought me from, of how he blessed me. I will dance, I will jump, I will leap, I will shout. I remember what the Lord has done for me. That's what I praise him for. I don't praise him because I'm singing good. I don't praise him because he's preaching good. I don't praise him because my mama's with me. I praise Him because I was on my way to hell and the Lord reached down into my life and picked me up. That's what I praise Him for. That's what I praise Him for. He never forgot where He was when the Lord called 
when the Lord anointed him. And more than all of that, he didn't forget the Lord. And the Bible says, and she despised him in her heart. Oh, that's so sad. It's so, so sad when you realize, Sister Maria, it wasn't rooted in a desire to be ugly to David. It wasn't rooted in the fact that, oh my goodness, you know, a shame, embarrassment. It was rooted in the fact, the truth of the matter is, she was ignorant. She did not know. Because, Brother Pete, when we know... <laughs> When you know what the Lord, you know what? If we could sometimes, and you'll excuse this expression, if we could sometimes just let it all hang out. If we could have one night where we lock the doors and everybody stand up and really tell where God brought you from. And to tell how nasty and how vile we wouldn't have to worry about it. If some of us testified at the places we've been, we'd look up and there wouldn't be nobody left sitting around us. Huh? So, when I praise Him, I ain't really praising Him. I wonder what's got into Him. I ain't praising Him for the things you know about. I'm praising for the things that ain't nobody but me and him knows about. I'm praising him. I'm praising him because I know. Remember Brother D.C. used to sing it. It's old, old, old. I remember Sister Michelle, we used to go to the AOC. They sang it all the time. They had about 17 verses to it. But it says, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. And one of their verses says, you can't tell it like I can what the Lord has done for me. And then another one, Brother Rice said, you can't tell it, so let me tell it what the Lord has done for me. She despised Him in her heart. It wasn't a matter if she didn't like Him, she loved Him. It wasn't a matter if she didn't want Him home because that's her husband. But all of a sudden, this ain't something she can relate to. It's not something she can understand. Remember, she was the daughter of the king before she was the wife of the king. King Saul was her father, the first king of Israel. And David's not acting like a king. But I want you to remember the word, oh God, help me right now, help somebody. Oh Jesus. I want you to remember the words of Samuel when he came and admonished Saul. 1 Samuel 15 and 17, Samuel said unto Saul, When thou wast little in your own sight. When thou wast little. Remember when they came to anoint Saul, do y'all remember that? Do you remember the story? The prophet was hunting for Saul. He was going to be the king. And you know what, Brother Rice? They couldn't find him. Because even though he was head and shoulders physically above every man in Israel, he wasn't full of himself. He was bashful. He wasn't hunting for anointing. He wasn't hunting for nothing special. They found him hid in the baggage. And the Lord had to get some donkeys lost even to get him out of his hole. The anointed him king, Brother Terry. But Saul forgot where he came from. I want you to listen to me right now. I felt the Holy Ghost led me to say this. Where did Michael get her idea of how a king was supposed to act? From her daddy. She didn't, because she'd ever all she'd ever seen was kingly behavior. But Saul let his status go to his head. Be careful, mom and dad. The attitude you project at home will be the attitude your children acquire. 
If you're a worshiper, 